When the skin has been damaged, a sequence of events has to occur to repair the skin and return its normal or almost normal structure and function. Two kinds of wound healing processes can occur depending on the depth of the injury. Epidermal wound healing occurs following wounds that affect only the epidermis. Deep wound healing occurs following wounds that penetrate the dermis. So let's look briefly at epidermal wound healing. So an injury has occurred and the wound may extend down to the dermis, but really only the epidermis is really damaged. So these basal cells in the stratum basale here sort of break away or detach from the, the basement membrane below, or if the basement membrane has been damaged as well, they simply detach from the surrounding tissues. And as they do so, they start migrating or moving in toward each other to close that injured area. Once they do so, the cells start undergoing mitosis to create new cells. And as they create new cells, of course, new junctions are formed between those cells, creating new layers and layers and layers of tissue until the epidermis is thickened and it's back to its normal state. So pretty straightforward, pretty easy to see how this heals just by creating a new layer upon layer upon layer of the epidermis. Deep wound healing occurs when an injury extends to the dermis and the subcutaneous layer. Because we've got multiple layers of tissue that must be repaired, the healing is more complex than just epidermal healing like we saw. So deep wound healing occurs in four different phases, an inflammatory phase, a migratory phase, a proliferative play phase, and a maturation phase. So during the inflammatory phase, a blood clot forms in the wound and it just sort of loosely pulls the edges or unites the edges of the wound together. During the inflammatory phase, chemicals are going to be released that cause the blood vessels to dilate and as they do so, then your white blood cells can come in to start cleaning up the area. So macrophages, macrophages come in and phagocytize any foreign bacteria and mesenchymal or embryonic cells that are your stem cells are going to develop into fibroblast and start secreting fibers down into that area. So that's the inflammatory phase. Bring in the things, bring in the immune system cells, secrete those chemicals that cause the inflammatory response. The next three phases are going to do the work of the repair of the wound. So during the migratory phase, the clot becomes a scab. The epithelial cells start to migrate beneath the scab to bridge or close the wound up. Fibroblasts migrate and uh, start making fibrin thread and collagen fibers that begin sort of synthesizing or making scar tissue out of those fibers. Damaged blood vessels begin to regrow. It's during this phase that the tissue filling the wound is called granulation tissue. During the proliferative phase, extensive growth of the epithelial cells beneath the scalp, depositing uh, fibroblasts depositing down more collagen fibers in random patterns and new blood vessels begin to grow. And finally, during the maturation phase, the scalp is going to be sloughed off uh, because the epidermis has been restored back to its normal thickness and new cells are pushing against that scalp to push it away. The collagen fibers become more organized and the fibroblasts decrease in their number and blood vessels are restored back to normal. So we've restored the tissue, gotten it back to normal, gotten all of our blood supply rebuilt, and if it wasn't, excuse me, let me back up. If it wasn't a really, really deep tissue or really, really deep damage and the tissue is replaced with functional tissue, then that functional tissue goes right back into doing its job. However, it, the functional tissue may be replaced with scar tissue. So the initial filling of the tissue may be sometimes referred to as fibrosis, but sometimes so much scar tissue develops during deep wound healing that a raised scar or one that's elevated above the normal surface develops. Sometimes that scar tissue can retain a little bit of the normal function in the surrounding tissues, but sometimes if the wound was extensive, it can develop what is known as a keloid scar. 
that tissue differs from the normal skin because the collagen fibers are more dense and there's decreased elasticity and fewer blood vessels and oftentimes if it was in uh, skin that has hair or glands those may not be restored back to full function um, because of this of course the skin then can't do its normal job and that scar tissue remains uh, tough and fibrous in that area all right so age-related changes wow once you get old everything starts falling apart right so we talked a little bit about this as we've looked at other things and looked at creation of new tissues but aging has some very specific uh, consequences on the integumentary system so most of these age-related changes are going to begin about 40 and occur in the proteins in the dermis collagen fibers begin to decrease and get stiff and break apart and sort of get tangled up into a jumbled mat of, of tangled tissue that really doesn't do much. Elastic fibers start to wear out just like the elastic in your underwear wears out when it gets old. Um, fibroblast. You know, normally your fibroblasts are going to produce a lot of collagen and elastic fibers so that we retain that ability to stretch and recoil. Well, those fibroblasts decrease in number, so we're not making as much of those fibers. And as a result of all that, the skin starts to develop these crevices and furrows that we commonly call wrinkles. The pronounced effect of skin aging doesn't really become noticeable until people get into their later 40s. The macrophages decrease in number and become less efficient in cleaning up the area, so the immune system becomes less responsive. The decreased size of the sebaceous glands leads to dry skin and, and skin that's easily broken or damaged, so most suscept more susceptible to infection. Production of sweat decreases. The reducing the number of the melanocytes making pigment, so the hair tends to turn gray. Hair loss increases because the hair follicles stop producing hair as efficiently. Uh, this typically shows in males much earlier than females. Um, males may de develop something called male pattern baldness. Uh, the walls of the blood vessels in the epidermis become thicker and less permeable. Adipose tissue in the subcutaneous layer is lost, so the thin just overall becomes much, or the skin becomes overall just much thinner. As it does so, then the skin heals less properly and becomes more susceptible to conditions such as skin cancer and pressure sores. Um, the nails may become brittle as we're making less and less of the keratin and uh, the nail growth may slow. So the overall idea here is as you age, cells become less and less able to repair tissue with functional tissue. So let's look now at a homeostatic imbalance associated with uh, the epidermis or with the skin. So skin cancer can result from excessive exposure to ultraviolet radiation, such as simply being out in the sun or going into tanning salons. We always think that we look so much better with a tan. Well, each time that we are exposing ourselves to that excessive radiation, UV radiation, we're increasing the chance of developing skin cancer. So almost all of the 1 million cases of skin cancer that are diagnosed in the United States each year result from excessive UV radiation. There are three common types of skin cancer. Basal cell carcinoma, which accounts for about 78% of most skin cancers. They arise from the cells in the stratum basale of the epidermis and rarely metastasize or spread to other areas of the body. Squamous cell carcinomas account for about 25% of all skin cancers, and they arise from the stratum spinosum of the epidermis. Their ability to metastasize varies. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So basal and squamous cell carcinomas are together known as non-melanoma skin cancer. Malignant melanomas arise from melanocytes and account for about 2% of all skin cancers. The estimated lifetime risk of developing melanoma is about 1 in 75, which is about double the risk of 20 years ago. This is in part because of increased depletion of the ozone layer, which allows more UV radiation into our atmosphere. But the main reason? More of us are spending time in the sun, and more of us are going to tanning beds. 
Malignant melanomas can metastasize very rapidly and usually kill a person within a few months of diagnosis. So when we're looking at skin cancers, the key to successful treatment of these malignant melanomas is early detection. So early warning signs of malignant melanoma are identified by the ABCDE rule. So you look at things that are obvious on your skin, such as moles, and look for these particular signs. So A is for asymmetry. Malignant melanomas lack symmetry. This simply means that they have irregular shapes, such as two halves look very different. B is for border. Malignant melanomas typically have irregular, notched, indented, scalloped, or just indistinct borders. So they don't look very, very regularly shaped, I guess you could say. C is for color. Malignant melanomas tend to have an uneven color uh, development. They may even have several colors. So you may see a part of it is dark brown and a part of it's red. Uh, a part of it may be just sort of clear looking. D is for diameter. Ordinary moles are typically smaller than a pencil eraser. So anything larger than that may be indicative of a melanoma. And E is for evolving, and you may also see E as elevated or raised from the surface. But evolving malignant melanomas tend to change their size and their shape and their color. So once a malignant melanoma has the characteristics of A, B, and C, it's usually also E and D. It's large and it's evolving. Evolving, excuse me. So before we move on, some of the risk factors for skin cancer are the skin type. So individuals with light color skin who never tan but always burn are at high risk. Skin exposure or sun exposure, people who live in areas with a lot of sunlight per year or at high altitudes where the ultraviolet rays are more intense have a higher risk of developing skin cancer. On the other hand, people who engage in more outdoor occupations and who have suffered three or more sunburns have a higher risk. Uh, darker skin tends to have a lesser occasion of developing skin cancer because there's more melanin in the skin, therefore the DNA of the underlying cells is more protected. Family history can increase your role in skin cancers because the rates go up uh, to higher incidence in families that have more skin cancer than others. As you age, older people are, people are more prone to skin cancer because you've been exposed to the sunlight and UV radiation more throughout those increased number of years and mutations in the DNA can accumulate over a period of years. And then also just your overall immunological status. If you're immunosuppressed, you're more likely to have a higher incidence of developing skin cancer. So the big thing here is to be aware. Look at your skin and look at things that are abnormal. Notice when things are changing and if something doesn't look like it should, then go get it checked out. Have a dermatologist, a professional skin care clinician look at those changes and determine what's going on. Next, we'll look at burns. A burn is tissue damage caused by excess heat, electricity, radioactivity, or perhaps just corrosive chemicals that denature or break down proteins in the skin. Some burns destroy the skin's important contributions to homeostasis, meaning that the skin can no longer protect the body. So microbes get in, dehydration occurs, and we can also lose the ability for thermoregulation. So burns are classified according to their severity. A first degree burn involves only the epidermis. It's characterized by mild pain and redness but no blisters. Skin function usually remains intact. Sometimes just flushing the burn with cold water will lessen the pain and the degree of damage. Generally speaking, the healing of a first degree burn will, will happen in three to six days and it may be uh, characterized by some peeling or flaking. So an example of a first degree burn is simply what we get when we've been outside at the beach too long. So we develop a sunburn. A second degree burn destroys the epidermis and part of the dermis. Some of the skin functions may then be lost. In second degree burns, 
redness and blister formation, edema and pain typically result. Um, when a blister occurs, the epidermis has separated from the dermis and that allows an accumulation of the, the extracellular or tissue fluid between the two layers and then that pushes up and separates that dermis away so the blister develops. Some of the associated structures such as the hair follicles and the glands like the sebaceous and the sweat glands are usually not injured. And as long as you don't pop that blister, there's a low chance of infection. So skin grafting is usually not a problem. You don't have to have new skin put on. Healing tends to occur in about three to four weeks, but depending on how large the area was and how you cared for that burn, scarring may or may not result. So first and second degree burns are usually collectively referred to as partial thickness burns as compared to third degree burns, which are full thickness, destroys the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutaneous layer. So when you destroy all those layers, skin function is lost. Most burns, uh, or some of these burns, vary in appearance, in appearance from a, a white to maybe even a very dark or charred appearance. Uh, so they can be very wet or they can be very dry. This is usually marked by edema, so swelling in the area. The burn area may be numb because the sensory endings have been destroyed, while the tissue very close to the burn is going to be extremely painful. Those nerve cells are still in place. Regeneration occurs very slowly. A lot of granulation tissue tends to form before it's covered with new epithelial tissues, and it's in these third degree burns that skin grafting may have to uh, be a part of the healing process so that you can create new tissue that connects to that graft. I uh, remember we talked a little bit about grafting when we were looking at tissue regeneration uh, back in a previous lecture. So injury to the skin tissues directly in contact with the damaging agent is called the local effect of a burn. However, there are systemic effects that can be an even greater threat to life. So some of those systemic or of the body effects can include not being able to maintain body water, so dehydration, loss of blood, loss of plasma and proteins, bacterial infection because the barrier to the external environment has been lost, reduced circulation of the blood because one, you're losing uh, excess water, and two, of course, some of those blood vessels have been destroyed as well. Decreased production of urine because the body's trying to retain those waters and not lose fluid through the damage, and then diminished immune response. The seriousness of a burn is usually determined by the depth and the extent of the area involved, as well as the overall health and the age of the person. So we use something called the rule of nines to assess the area and the severity of a burn, which means we simply break the body into areas that are either multiples or divisions of nine. So for instance, each upper leg is 9% of the body. Uh, the trunk of the body is 18%, okay? So you assess the burns based on that rule of nines to look at how much of the body has been burned. Of course, the amount of the burn and the severity of that burn is going to determine how that burn is treated clinically. And just to give you a little bit of statistics to go along with this rule of nines and burns, according to the American Burn Association's classification of burn injuries, a major burn includes third degree burns over 10% of a body surface area, or second degree burns over 25% of a body surface area, or third degree burns on the face, hands, feet, or perineum, which includes the anal and urogenital areas. When a burn area exceeds 70%, more than half of the victims die. This should illustrate how a quick means for estimating the surface area of a burn is vitally important in treating a burn victim. Now, I'm not going to test you on these percentages, but I do want you to understand the importance of the rule of nines and the importance of quickly assessing the burns and, of course, the major uh, the major risk factors with those burns, including infection, dehydration, uh, shock, and the lack of body fluids and being able to maintain that barrier. 
All right, so just one last little um, homeostatic imbalance we'll look at here, and these are what we commonly call pressure sores or bed sores. These are caused by a constant deficiency of blood to tissues overlying a bony area that has been subjected to prolonged pressure against an object such as a bed or a cast or a splint. Not being able to get that blood supply in there, of course, results in tissue ulceration or bed sores. So the shedding of the epithelium caused by that deficiency of the blood causes this sore to develop. And oftentimes when this is someone that is confined to a bed, if they're not being moved and turned properly, these wounds may become very uh, extensive or very large and infected before anyone notices this.